All right. So we're studying the book of Ruth. I'll pick up and kind of give you a little uh, overview and get you set back to where we are. Uh, after being driven from Moab by a famine, you remember Elimelech and, and Ruth and their sons, Malon and Kilion, they wind up, they, they sojourn in Moab because of that famine. After that, Naomi's husband died, and then both of her sons died, neither of, neither of which had any children. And so what we have then is Elimelech's line is on the verge of extinction, which raises for the reader this question of what about this implied connection with David? Because when he says that he was an Ephrathite from Bethlehem, the reader's going to say, okay, David bells are going to be going off. And so the fact you have his line on the verge of extinction, it raises this question, what's going to come of that implied connection, for one? But it also, it leaves Naomi as a, an aging widow, leaves her in a very dire circumstance of no provision and no protection. We've talked about how difficult that would have been for her. Well, when she heads back to Bethlehem, after the famine is over, she goes back to Bethlehem, and her daughter-in-law, Ruth, wouldn't be dissuaded from, from going back with her. And we went through that where uh, Orpah goes back, but uh, Ruth says, no way. I'm not going back. Takes an oath and says, listen, may God do this and more to me if anything but death parts me from you. Well, her demonstration there, her demonstration to Naomi of hesed, of God's loving kindness, is God working through Ruth to reverse Naomi's emptiness. But, but Naomi, see, at that point in time, because of her hopelessness and her resignation, because all that she had gone through, she feels that God has targeted her. And she is in this dark hole, so she doesn't see the hand of God in Ruth's expression of hesed toward her. God is already beginning to work to reverse her emptiness. But at that point, uh, Naomi is oblivious to it. Well, back in Bethlehem, Ruth goes out to scavenge in the fields for food. That's what gleaning was. She goes out to scavenge in the fields for food, and we're told that she happened, in chapter 2, verse 3, she happened to come to the section of the field owned by Boaz, a man from the clan of Elimelech. And so, as, as I've emphasized, this idea which says it just happened, it means exactly the opposite. Okay, as Daniel Block says in his commentary, I've, that I, the quote I've given to you several times, he says, the author is here screaming, see the hand of God at work here. So it just happened to go out and wind up in this field where this uh, member of the clan of Elimelech owns, that he owns that section of the field. So God's providence is at work here, and uh, the writer is expressing that. Now, Boaz also just happens to show up at the field at the exact time. Ruth just happened to be where he could notice her. All of these things are saying, listen, this is not happenstance. This is providence. God is at work here. All right, Boaz learns that, that Ruth is the Moabite who came back with Naomi from Moab, and he tells Ruth to glean only in his fields, and he lets her know that, he, that he, he's telling his men not to mess with her. And then he invites her also to share in the water that he brings for his workers out to the field. And Ruth is just, she's blown away by his kindness and generosity and compassion toward her. And later, Boaz invites Ruth to share in the midday meal that he provides for his workers. And you recall, he gives her more than she can eat. So he continues his kindness toward her. And when she goes up to, rises to return to glean in the fields, he tells his workers, he says, listen, uh, you don't even mess with her, don't correct her or rebuke her, even if she gleans among the piles of cut grain, which would be a no-no for her, gleaner. You don't want the gleaner over there taking the harvest. So he says, even if she gleans there, you let her go ahead and do that. And by the way, when you're harvesting and you're pulling stuff in bundles that you cut and cut and cut and get the big pile, and you drop it down and you start cutting again, throw some stuff down for her to find. Okay, so he's telling them, look, you really, you take care of her. And they obviously took that to heart. Ruth winds up. With about, uh, she winds up with, winds up with about 30 pounds or 50 pounds, depending on how you uh, calculate these weights. So 30 pounds or 50 pounds of grain, which is an amazing amount for one day of gleaning, scavenging. I mean, you're, you're going around trying to find stuff. It's not like you're out harvesting. You're going around, you know, gleaning. And so she winds up with a huge one. She lugs her bounty back to town. 
And Naomi recognizes that this surprisingly large amount, that 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 indicates that somebody had shown her favor. You don't go out gleaning and wind up with 30 to 50 pounds of stuff in a day and say, okay. Uh, So she recognizes somebody had showed her favor. And when Ruth identifies her benefactor, she says, oh, the guy's Boaz. Boaz and Naomi erupts in this request for God to bless him. And she praises Yahweh as, as the one who has not abandoned his hesed toward the living and the dead. And I emphasize to you that was a significant point because up to this up to this point, Naomi has been in this dark hole of seeing herself as essentially cursed by God. She's driven from Israel by a famine. Her husband dies. One son dies. Another son dies. She has no grandchildren. She's just completely empty. And she feels that God has targeted her. And so she's in this funk. When she returns, you remember, she says, don't call me Naomi. Don't call me good or pleasant. That no longer fits my circumstance. You call me Mara because God has dealt bitterly with me. So that's her situation. But what happens now when she sees this, quote, coincidence that that Ruth has gone out and wound up in the field of Boaz and Boaz has treated her so kindly The bells are going off and she is seeing God's hand here. That's why this is significant where she says that that Yahweh has not abandoned his hesed, his loving kindness toward the living, toward Ruth and Naomi or the dead Elimelech and Malon. Okay, so this is a turning point now where she is coming out of her funk and beginning to have some sense of hope that God, in fact, will work to bless her life. Okay, we need to see that. We need to recognize Things happen in life that can drive us into dark places. And God is at work. And here you see him beginning to reverse that. He began to reverse it with Ruth's expression of hesed toward Naomi, but she couldn't see it. Now, even she can't miss it. This heart that she has renewed by the hope of God's favor, she seems to realize the potential here that Boaz presents both for Ruth as a potential husband and also, therefore, for the survival of Elimelech's and Malon's line. So now she's she's brightening up. She's beginning to see, you know, she instead of just this down and this funk, this dark hole, she's beginning to look and say, God is going to work to bless me. And so she takes this on and that shapes what she does here in the future. Now that Naomi is beginning to hope that way. It's, it's, you can see it along these, uh, that she's thinking along these lines. You can see this from the fact she exclaims that Boaz is a close relative, one of their kinsmen redeemers. It says here, Naomi, the last line here, Naomi also said to her, the man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers, or it's kinsman redeemer, a goel. So we, she, you can see that she's doing that. Now, as, as I said last week, the kinsman redeemer, this is a, you know, it's, it's not a relationship, a set relationship. Like I said, like an uncle, niece, any, you know, anything like that. It's not defined that way. A kinsman redeemer was the person responsible for the repurchase of property once owned by a clan, clan member that the clan member sold out of economic necessity. Well, this person is somebody who's like a guardian of the clan. And it changes on who is the kinsman redeemer. It depends on who's the closest one. And they have a responsibility to buy this back into the clan's ownership to restore the land to the original owner so that the, it, it might be maintained as the clan's inheritance. Now, that's that's something that you see clearly. Now, what is not as clear, except here in the book of Ruth, is this idea that somehow connected to that is this idea of maintaining on the redeemed property the deceased male's lineage. So there's this idea of, you know, about the leveret marriages, you know, where you, if somebody dies childless, then the brother is to, is to marry and have children so that their lineage. Well, here you see kind of a fusion of these two things in the role of a kinsman redeemer. You see that here in the book of Ruth. Now, the duties of this kinsman redeemer are quite broad. And apparently, as I say, they included this obligation somehow not only to bring property back, but also to continue on that property the deceased male's lineage. And that's going to be important, obviously, for the story. And when we ended last week, I was suggesting to you that the situation involved in Ruth, and I'd mentioned it the week before, it was unusual. Okay, so in other words, it's not a standard situation. So I think there was some uncertainty about how does the law apply here. 
Well, what's different about it? Well, we have a widow who is surviving, but she's beyond childbearing years. And then we have his daughter-in-law. Her husband is dead, and she's a Moabite. So you have a lot of other factors that come in on how does the principle apply in the, it's an atypical situation. And I think that's significant because I think that helps explain why uh, Ruth uses, Naomi uses through Ruth such discretion in bringing up this kinsman redeemer duty. Okay, I said all that before, but uh, I want to get you back to where we are now into this section here. Ruth adds, she adds here that Boaz also told her that she could work in in his field, sticking close to his workers until they finished the entire harvest. Okay, that means the harvest both of barley and wheat. And the, the wheat harvest would begin about two weeks after the barley harvest started. Naomi here, she approves of Boaz's offer and she tells Ruth it's good for her to go out with Boaz's female servants. And when Ruth had said it, she had said it used a word that, that included all the servants. And when when uh, when Naomi responds to her, she says, no, it's good for you to go out with the female servants. So she's going to be going out in the field. She thinks that's a good idea. And she points out that in another field, she would run the risk of mistreatment. So she thinks, OK, this she's all for this plan. Now, verse 23, it summarizes here what follows. So she kept close to the young women of Boaz gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvests, and she lived with her mother-in-law. This means that Ruth would have been in Boaz's fields from late April to early June, so we're talking about six or seven weeks when she would have been in this field, but we don't hear anything else about it. See, there's, there's nothing else is reported about any, any encounters that she has with Boaz, so you're left wondering as a reader, what is going to come of this providential encounter that Ruth had with Boaz? We're all we're saying, OK, this is something's going on here. And he says, well, she stayed out there and she worked. And at the end of the barley harvest and she's living with Naomi. And you're going, what? <laughs> you know, what's happening? What, what is going to what is going to be coming on? What's going to happen? All right. Chapter three, verse one it says, then Naomi, her mother in law, said to her. My daughter, should I not seek rest for you that it may be that it may be well with you? Is not Boaz our relative with whose young women you were? See, he's winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself and put on your cloak and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he's finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, all that you say, I will do. Now, Naomi here, she indicates by a rhetorical question where it says, then Naomi, her mother-in-law said, my daughter, should I not seek rest for you that it may be well with you? She indicates by this rhetorical question that she should take steps to find a husband for Ruth. See, somebody who would provide for Ruth security and protection. And she then identifies Boaz as their relative. All right, so that then suggested in Naomi's mind, the one who should become Ruth's husband is Boaz. So this is what she's thinking. Shouldn't I go ahead and, you know, fix this up for you? Provide for your security and protection by hooking you up with Boaz. So that's what that idea is, is what that's what she's talking about. Notice that here she says nothing about continuing Elimelech's and Malon's line. See, that's not really at, at the forefront of her mind right now. That's going to be, see, it is significant. It's especially significant for Boaz. And Naomi has already referred to it. But her focus here is on getting a husband for Ruth. That's really what she's interested in. And it might be that her sense of duty in that regard has grown and grown as she has seen Ruth's tremendous loyalty toward her. So now she feels more and more that, hey, I really need to do something to take care of her. She is showing me this tremendous hesed, this devotion and this loyalty. I need to do something to take care of her. And she has a plan. Naomi has a plan for encouraging Boaz to assume what she perceives is his responsibility. So she has an idea of what his responsibility is as the kinsman redeemer. And she has a plan to encourage him to assume that responsibility presumably not realizing that he is not the nearest kinsman redeemer. I don't think she's aware of that. But she so she thinks he's the nearest kinsman redeemer. and She has a plan to encourage him to assume what she takes to be 
his responsibility in that regard. And she calls Ruth's attention to the fact. She says, hey, Boaz is going to be spending the night on the threshing floor winnowing, winnowing barley. And then she instructs Ruth what she ought to do. Okay, he's going to be down there threshing barley down there on, you know, winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Here's here's the plan. So she tells Ruth, he says, look, you go ahead and bathe. And, you know, people didn't bathe all the time then. Okay, so she says, look, you bathe and you put on some perfume and you take your cloak. Now, this isn't any kind of fancy dress. This is simply a coat, a cloak, something presumably she's having her take it to keep warm. She says, you go and you go down to the threshing floor. That's where Boaz is going to be. Now, it's possible <clears throat> by analogy to 2 Samuel 12, 20, where David, you know, he washes and anoints himself after, after he gets the word of the death. It's possible that Naomi's telling Ruth to end her period of mourning and to resume normal life. Here's what Block says in his commentary. He says, we know too little about how long widows would customarily wear their mourning clothes. But it may be that Naomi's now telling Ruth the time has come to doff her garments of widowhood, Genesis 38, 14 and 19, and let Boaz know that she's ready to return to normal life, including marriage, if that should become possible. So we don't know what she's wearing before. It's possible that she's giving off a signal now that the mourning period is over, something like that. But, uh, you know, that may not be right. That's just an interesting possibility. Now, Naomi, she tells Ruth not to reveal her presence. Not to reveal her presence until after Boaz had finished eating and drinking and had gone to bed. All right, after he'd lain down for the night. She adds that Ruth is to observe where he lies down and that presumably after he's fallen asleep, she is then to go over there and uncover his feet. Now, some people think that it may be more of the lower leg, not just the feet. But she's to uncover his feet and then she is to lie down herself. And Naomi said Boaz would tell her what to do after that. Now, this strikes us as bizarre, I know. All right, I mean, he's sitting there, what is this about? What's going on? Now, this obviously was some kind of symbolic gesture that Boaz was expected to understand in doing this. I mean, we're sitting here, we're out of it culturally. I mean, we're talking about Israelite culture from 3,000 years ago. Okay, so we're, you know, we look at this and say, but obviously he was expected to understand it. Now, given Ruth's marriage proposal in verse 9, which is clear, that, that she's, she's in that situation. I'll say, talk about that in a second. She clearly is, makes a marriage proposal toward him. Now, given that marriage proposal in verse 9, it may be you see that lying at Boaz's feet symbolized that proposal by presenting herself as one who was humbly seeking his protection. You see that as I uncover his feet and I lie at his feet, maybe it symbolized that I'm seeking your protection. I'm seeking for you Okay, but I, I don't know. But he clearly was it was intended that he would understand this. Now, waiting until Boaz finished his meal, finished eating and drinking is what he says, finished, you know, the whole the whole meal. Probably this is designed to increase the likelihood that he's going to be in a good mood. He's going to be full. He's going to be content. And so what is it? We want to maximize the possibility that he is going to be open to this proposal. So you don't want to go in there when the guy's chapped. You know, you don't want to go in there when he's in a foul mood. You want to, and she's telling him, wait. You wait till he's, you know, he's had his full, everything's fine. And so we're going to maximize the opportunity that he will wind up saying this. And, and likewise, now this is, this is a, a disputed thing, but this is what I think. I think it's the same vein with this thing about uncovering his feet. That may have been designed... To allow Ruth to speak to him in private after everyone else had either left the threshing floor or was asleep. In other words, I want to make sure there's nobody around. And if anybody is around, they're asleep. So th this idea of uncovering his feet may have been designed to ensure that without risking any feelings that negative feelings of her having awakened him. In other words, I think the idea is that, listen. You wait till this guy is full, content, and he goes to sleep. Then I want you to uncover his feet and you just lie there and wait. By doing that, he will gradually on his own awaken. Why? Because he's going to be cold. He will awaken so you will not then have the idea of waking him up. And if you've ever been awakened by somebody, you know that you can be grouchy toward that person. Okay, so I think the idea is that you do that and then let this gentle process Awaken him, he will then see you there and then go ahead and then we'll, we'll carry on with it. 
Okay, I think, that, I think that's what he's talking about and what is behind that, because the cold would gradually wake him. I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. Now, perhaps Naomi wanted to keep the exchange discreet. You say, well, why, why all this, you know, 007 stuff? Why all of this, uh, you know, I, I don't quite get it. Well, I think what's going on is she wants to keep this exchange discreet to minimize or contain any embarrassment in the event that this proposal is misinterpreted or rejected. I, I think she wants to be sure, listen, do it, uncover it, so I want it to be late in the middle of the night when there's nobody there. Okay, when everybody, any, they've either left the threshing floor, if anybody's still there, they're going to be sound asleep, so it's going to be very, very private. See, so how do you do that? You make sure he's asleep, but we're going to make sure that he wakes up in the middle of the night when everybody's either gone or asleep. So it's just going to be the two of you. Now, why? I think it's, it's to contain any embarrassment. If Ruth's, I mean, if Naomi's concept of the kinsman redeemer's responsibility that she is going to propose, which I think is defensible or she wouldn't be making it, but I think it's debatable. So there's some risk here that you're going to have Boaz say, what are you, crazy? Are you trying to foist on me some kind of uh, ridiculous duty? And so then it would be like, you know, here's the here, I mean, roof's caught in the middle there going, what did you send me to do? I come here and I'm saying, here's your duty, and this guy's jumping on me. He's accusing me of some kind of, you know, putting one over on him. All right, or if, if you wind up and she says that and this guy balks at it, and then it turns out that he does, in fact, that is the, a, a right read of his duty. Well, then he's going to look like a cheapskate and somebody who's not gracious. So if, if this happens, here you can contain it. We then at least have the option of saying, okay, we'll just keep this between us. Okay? If it doesn't work out, if there's some misunderstanding, we at least, whereas if we go public with it, we don't have that. That's what I think is going on, and that's why I think you have this being done, uh, being done so discreetly. Now, notice how Naomi is willing to act. I think this is, this is interesting and significant. She's willing to act in light of her sense of God's providential maneuvering. She has seen the hand of God in this happening uh, occurrence where, you know, where, where Ruth winds up. She just happened to be at Boaz's field. He just happened to arrive there. She just happened to be, and he's been bestowing all of this bounty on her. She sees God's providential hand in that. And in light of that, she's willing to go ahead and act. And here's what uh, Robert Hubbard says in his uh, commentary. He says, a significant theological point emerges here. Earlier, Naomi had wished for these same things. Chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, where she's saying, you know, may you be able to go back and have a husband and that kind of thing. Hey, she, it's all right. She had, so she had wished for these, uh, these same things. Now, here, here human means... Right, this is Naomi's plan, carry out something previously understood to be Yahweh's providence. In response to providentially given opportunity, Naomi began to answer her own prayer. See, she had before said, may God give you this husband. Well, now she is working toward securing a husband. Toward, she is working providentially, she says, in response to providentially given opportunity, Naomi begins to answer her own prayer. Thus, she models one way in which divine and human actions work together. Believers are not to wait passively for events to happen. Rather, they must seize the initiative when an opportunity presents itself. This is what we mean, open door. Right? We say, God opened the door. He gave the opportunity. Well, we don't know they'll sit there. She saw God working and she said, okay. <laughs> I get it. I'm going to go ahead and then give you all the opportunity to work. Okay, so they assume that God presents the opportunity. In Naomi's case, any success presumably would be part of Yahweh's full payment of Ruth. Chapter 2, verse 12. If so, then, theologically, Yahweh acts in Naomi's acts. That is what Naomi does constitute at the, constitutes at the same time God's acts. Her acts execute God's plans. See, so what is she doing? She is doing something that she believes is, an, is a matter of integrity in, sh in returning to Ruth. Something that Ruth has given to her, this hesed and her, Ruth's expression to her of this quality of God. And then Naomi says, listen, I need to do something. I need to, to secure a husband for you. And in acting that way, what is she doing? She is the vehicle and the means by which God will do that. So when we act that way, 
God is working through us. You saw that before. You saw that with, uh, with Boaz. When he's saying, listen, he wants God, you know, under who you've, you've come under God's wings and then he's going to protect her. Well, he then becomes the instrument through which God protects Ruth. And so do you see this? I, I just thought that was interesting and I think it's, uh, it's significant. Get that guy to go back there. Okay, as a dutiful daughter-in-law, Ruth says simply in, in verse 5, she says that she will do all that, is, that Naomi has asked her to do. So Naomi lays out this plan, and then, then Ruth says, all that you say, I will do. And then the following verse, it summarizes that she did indeed do just that. Verse 6, it says, so she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry... He went to lie down at the end of the grain. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man, see, I've modified this, shivered. I'll talk about that in a second. At midnight, the man shivered and turned over, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. He said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a kinsman redeemer. Or ESV simply says, Redeemer. Now, verse 7, it reports Ruth sneaking up on Boaz after he'd eaten, this, ate, eaten his meal and fallen asleep and un- uncovering his legs. When, it's, when it says here, and when Boaz had eaten and drunk, sorry, she, he went to lie down. And then she came softly. Okay, so she's, he's asleep and she's coming up here going, whoop. she's going to uncover either his feet or, or perhaps his lower legs. As, as I said, some think that they're, you know, it, it goes up higher than just the feet. But uh, now with with Robert Hubbard and with Daniel Block and a number of other people, I think the meaning of verse eight is not that Boaz was shaking from fear at midnight. See, this idea of trembling is what the word is about. And most people or translations, they take it as trembling in some kind of fear. And then that's why you wind up getting here that he was startled. Okay, as though he was startled by some unexplained phenomenon. And I don't think that's the right sense here that you ought to take this. I think they ought to take it as shivered, as those two Hebrew scholars argue, and I think that makes a lot of sense. That he's, he's shivered, okay, he's shivering, what? He's shivering from the cold. I mean, this is early June, but still it's late at night when you're out somewhere and you somebody rolls your stuff up. I mean, he's got a blanket or something he's sleeping under. You pull that up. If you've been out camping, which I don't do, I avoid camping at all costs. <laughs> Unless it happens to be right on a hotel somewhere, but... Uh, but uh, so you can see, I mean, this is, uh, you know, he, he, he lifts these things up. So I think that's that's what's happening. He then turned over and he's surprised to find this woman lying at his feet and a woman he couldn't recognize in the darkness. And you can imagine it'd be pretty dark, right? I mean, we don't have lights from a city shining or anything like that. This is dark. And rather than seeking to, to take sexual advantage of the situation, which I could imagine many guys doing, right? This guy's sleeping out here. He's out in the he's out nowhere. And he wakes up and there's this, there's this babe at his feet. He might just you know, not even ask questions. He'd be saying, I know what this is about. You see, but he, Boaz doesn't do that. He doesn't seek to take sexual advantage of her. He asked Ruth who she was and Ruth says, I am your servant. Spread your wings over your servant for you are a redeemer, a kinsman redeemer. And the word that she uses here for servant which is different from the word that she used in her self-deprecating statement in chapter 2, verse 13. That was like the lowest of the low, somebody who didn't have any potential. And she said, and I will never be like one of your servants. Well, the word for servant she uses here is different. It indicates that she's eligible for marriage. This servant person was somebody in a class who would have been eligible for marriage. And the the request for Boaz to spread his wings over her, this is a clear request to marry her. You say, well, it doesn't seem very clear to me. I understand that, <laughs> you see. But that's because where we're removed, we are removed from the situation. Here's Daniel Block in his commentary. He says, without equivocation, Ruth requests that Boaz marry her. The idiom she used may be puzzling to the modern reader, but there was no question about its meaning in the Israelite context in which it was given. See, so this is, this is clear. When she says that, you spread your wings over, bring me into your household. You bring me into your protection. She is saying to him, uh, I want you to marry me. And then in chapter 2, two in 2.12, you remember back in 2.12, Boaz had prayed for Yahweh under whose wings Ruth had come for refuge. 
to grant Ruth a full reward for her loving kindness to Naomi. He had prayed for that to happen. For, for Ruth's demonstration of Hesed that God would grant her a full reward for that. And so Ruth is here essentially asking Boaz to answer his own prayer. You have prayed for this. Well, she says, now you bring me into your protection and your household. You marry me. And you, you bring me in that way and you answer your own prayer. Well, you've been asking that I be given. God give me full reward for my loving kindness toward Naomi. Well, OK, here it is. You you go ahead and do that. You, in essence, answer your own prayer. His marrying her would be Yahweh's provision of protection for her and his reward for her kindness. It's the same idea again. That in our actions, as we act as we should, what is happening? Well, that God is working to bless her. Here's what Robert Hubbard says. He says, theologically, God worked here not by direct intervention, but within righteous human acts. That is God at work. You see, no thunder, no lightning, but that is God working to bless Ruth, to bless Naomi, but he's doing it through people that if you wind up saying, what, you you think God is working through you? Yeah, (laughs) I do. I do think he's working through me. And then later he says, in this case, the righteous human act was Boaz's execution of his duty as Goel as the kinsman redeemer. This suggests something further. God works through human obedience to his legal instructions. So he's saying, you go ahead and live this out. You act this way. And God is the one who is through you. He is the one who is blessing. He is the one who is doing that. You see, he's the one giving it, giving those blessings uh, to the people. Now, Ruth bases her request on the fact that Boaz is a kinsman redeemer. It says here down in verse nine. Who are you? He asked, and then she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant. Marry me in, in the idiom of the day, for you are a kinsman redeemer. So she bases her request on the fact he is a kinsman redeemer. Now, this raises a difficult question that I've tried to, I've hinted at already. The difficult question is, look, if Boaz is legally obligated to marry Ruth, if that is his legal duty, Okay, because he's kinsman redeemer, that's what he's got to do. Well, then why risk this nighttime rendezvous on the threshing floor rather than simply say, hey, that's your legal duty. Do it. See, I mean, why go through all of this? Why do this thing? You know, like the other place when when it talks about leveret marriage, it's somebody who will not do it. You woke up, take their sandal, I forget, spit in their face or do something like that. I mean, it's like, hey, if you won't live up to your duty, you're dirt. Well, if the guy, if the guy, if this is such a clear duty, why all this skullduggery and all this kind of stuff? Well, I've tried to, uh, you know, I've explained to you why, what I think is behind this, why this is going on. You see, I suspect Naomi's view, again, of, of the kinsman redeemer duty is something that's debatable. I think that, you know, something that, that I think it's, it's just, it's an under, it's a, a a reasonable extrapolation and understanding of it, but I think it's debatable and perhaps Naomi was emboldened to have Ruth assert her understanding of the kinsman redeemer's duty because she recognized that God had providentially brought Ruth into contact with Boaz. She understood that and recognized that. So she's emboldened to do that. And she suspected then that because God's hand is in this, she thinks that Boaz will accept that responsibility. So maybe she's willing to be a little more forceful than she would have been because she says, listen, all right, I recognize it. God is at work here, so I'm going to go ahead and present this broader concept of the kinsman redeemer's duty, which is reasonable, which certainly is in keeping with the principle, and we are dealing with an atypical situation. So she winds up saying, listen, I think, you know, go ahead. So she's emboldened to have Ruth go ahead and assert this. And indeed, her her instructions to Ruth to do whatever Boaz told her to do, that seems to assume that she's expecting Boaz to respond favorably to this. When she says, look, you do whatever he tells you to do. Well, Naomi, she probably had the matter raised in private again. Why? I think to minimize or contain this this potential embarrassment in the event she's wrong. Okay, in the event that Boaz rejected the proposal. So by raising it in private, she keeps the option of of keeping the matter between themselves. She preserves that option in case it turns out she's misread the situation. 
case she turns out that Boaz says, what? What, are you crazy? Get out of here. Trying to stick me with this kind of thing. You must be crazy. All right, well, see, that, you know, that wouldn't be pleasant for anybody. Certainly not for Ruth. And also, uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be for Naomi either. Now, Naomi's view of Boaz's duty, you see, this is why Ruth is willing to be so forward in asking Boaz to marry her. You think, why in the world is she willing to go up and do that? It is because Ruth tells her this is the responsibility of a kinsman redeemer. Otherwise, I don't think she'd ever do it. I mean, in, in the absence of such a duty, the request of a Moabite servant girl to marry an Israelite man of wealth and stature, that would have been unthinkable affrontery. That would have been what we'd say, chutzpah. You know, you, you know here I'm a, I'm a Moabite servant girl. And I'm going to bop in and ask this guy of wealth and standing. Oh, yeah, by the way, dude, why don't, we, why don't you marry me? Okay, what I think is at work here is that Naomi has explained, no, this is the kinsman. Okay, so now she's willing to assert it because she recognizes that this is a legal responsibility that she has, at least as conceived by, by Naomi. So I think that's what's happening. Now, being a foreigner, she's probably unaware that Naomi's broader, more liberal view is debatable. I mean, she's an outsider. What in the world is she going to know about all the ins and outs of uh, uh, Israelite family law? She's relying on Naomi for that. Okay, so I think that now she sends her on this mission. So Naomi sends Ruth on this mission because Naomi thought God would bring success. That's what I think is motivating Naomi in light of her perception of God's providential involvement. She believes that Boaz is going to say yes, that God is leading her in this direction. She's going to have Ruth make this proposal. She expects him to wind up saying yes. But she arranged it in such a way that the fallout could be limited if she was wrong in that assessment. All right, that's how I put it together. That's what I think is going on there. Now, some are convinced in in verse 9 here where it says, He said, Who you are? And she answered, I'm Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant. For you are redeemers, you are a kinsman redeemer. Some think that that Ruth in that verse raised the kinsman redeemer duty on her own. That that was her thing. And that Naomi had nothing to do with that. But uh, I don't believe that. You see, that seems to me to be contrary to the summary statement in verse 6. That Ruth did everything Naomi commanded her. Now, the, the, what I get from that is that the emphasis is on her compliance with Naomi's instructions, not on her striking out on her own. So I don't think that that she's just bringing this up on her own. Ruth would have been dependent on Naomi for knowledge about Israelite law and custom regarding kinsmen and redeemers. If if Naomi had said anything to her, do you think Ruth, this Moabite woman, is going to wind up saying, hey, by the way, spread your wings over me. You're the kinsman redeemer. I don't think she would have done that because she's certainly an outsider in terms of Israelite family law. I think she's dependent on Naomi for this kind of understanding. As uh, uh, Frederick Bush says, In his commentary, he says, when Ruth does more than mutely obey the instructions Naomi gave her, that she should lie down at Boaz's legs and that he would tell her what to do, she is neither changing those instructions nor violating them, but simply putting into words what Naomi voiced in her opening statement in verses 1 and 2, must I not seek for you home and husband? So then, is not Boaz a relative of ours? You see, so he says that implicit in what she's saying is this idea that you are to marry him because he's the kinsman redeemer. So I don't I don't think that this is something that Ruth has brought up on her own. I think this is all part of the idea, all part of Naomi's strategy. Now, the tension at this point in the story, at least as I'm as I see it, is whether Boaz is going to embrace Naomi's view of the kinsman redeemer duty, whether he's going to see this as a proper expression of the clan guardian principle inherent in the kinsman redeemer role. Is he going to accept this, that that's a proper uh, extrapolation, a proper application of that principle to this setting, or whether he's going to refuse to help, he's going to take umbrage at the request and insist on a narrower interpretation of his responsibility? See, that's what, I, that's what I think the tension is. Now, based on what, what's already been revealed about Yahweh's providential involvement in the situation and about Boaz's character, it's not surprising how he does respond. But I think in the story, the tension in the story comes from that. And then we get here in verse 10, it says, And he said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter, 
You have made this last kindness greater than the first, in that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask, for all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. I'm not going to have time to get through this, but you know how I'm going to do what I can. <laughs> I'll just keep talking. All right. Now, Boaz, he reacts what he reacts very positively to to Ruth's proposal rather than chastising her for trying to foist on him a duty he didn't know. Rather than doing that, see, he in verse 10, he invokes a blessing on her and he praises her. See, he praises her here for taking her devotion to Naomi so far as to seek to marry him for the family's sake. Rather than to pursue younger men, whether for love or security, whether poor or rich. You see, what he's, what he's doing here, he's praising her now for being willing to, to, for taking, you know, she's devoted to Naomi. She has said, listen, I'm, if anything separates me, I'm with you. But now he praises her for taking that devotion to him, uh, so far as to seek to marry him for the family's sake. Right. I mean, she could go out. She could go out and find other people. You know, this young woman, she's footloose. But what is she doing? Rather, she is going to, for the family's sake, marry this older dude. Right. She's going to marry this older dude. Why? Because of her responsibility and duty she has toward Naomi to have children that will then have the legal right for that property. Okay, so she is willing to marry him for the sake of the family. And he says, this is an even greater expression of devotion than your initial commitment to to Naomi. See, that's what's going on here, that she has now surpassed that. He says, when he says, you have made this last kindness greater than the first. That you're willing to take your devotion to her to the point that for the sake of the family, you will marry me. Instead of one of these young bucks you could have gotten. Okay? Instead of whether whether you married them for love, they're poor. Or whether you married one of these young guys for money, see, they're rich. You have not chosen to do that. You've chosen to go ahead and come with me. He says that that showing of hesed, that showing of family loyalty and devotion was greater than her original commitment to Naomi. She's taken it. To even a new height. And then Boaz tells Ruth in verse 11 not to fear he's going to do all that she asked, perhaps hinting there that there was more involved than simply marrying her. And in saying he'll do so, he, in saying he'll do so because he says for, this is kind of a, an odd little statement here. He says, OK, I'm going to do all, all that you say. I will do I will do for you all that you ask for. I'll do it because all fellow townsmen know that you're a worthy woman. You see, in, in saying that he's willing to do that uh, for that reason, because they know she's a worthy woman, he seems to be reassuring her. I'm going to do it, okay, because he's going to reassure her that he will, yes, indeed, I will go through with this. Because you don't have to worry that they are going to use your being a Moabite to discriminate against you and use their hostility against you as a Moabite to seek and try to find something wrong with my functioning as the kinsman redeemer and therefore your child being tied to this property. You don't have to worry about that. You have dispelled their hostility and their bigotry toward Moabite people by your exemplary character. So you have to worry. All right, I'll say more about that next week. Thanks for coming. I heard that bell.